So officially, I would like to thank you for joining this installment of the AABIP's webinar series. My name is David Shaw. I'm hosting today or moderating from Harbor UCLA Medical Center, and I will be co-moderating along with Russell Miller, who's joining us for MD Anderson. Today, we have the great uh, privilege to have Dr. Ali Musani join us. His uh, topic today will be the management of malignant pleural effusions from an interventional pulmonary perspective. Dr. Musani is the Director of Interventional Pulmonology, as well as the Chief of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Without any further ado, Dr. Musani, thank you very much for your time, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today uh, in this wonderful new series of webinars uh, from ABIP. ABIP has uh, put in a tremendous effort in uh, increasing our academic activities, and this is just one of the features of that. Um, and this uh, sort of uh, presentation is considered to be a part and parcel of our academic mission. Um, I today would uh, like to keep this uh, meeting very informal and very interactive. So instead of uh, doing a formal talk and then leaving 15 minutes or so in the end for question and answers, um, I thought that I will make it uh, um, questions right from the beginning. So I will uh, ask questions. They're more uh, like your way of doing things rather than an academic question. And then you can answer, and David will tell me um, how many different answers you have. And then I'll try to explain the different ways of doing things uh, or right or wrong answer. A lot of them are not terribly right or wrong. It's your way of doing it, or different ways of doing it. Uh, and as David said, our focus will be the management of fusion from all the um, usual technologies and modalities we have to the, to the novel modalities that we are now exploring. Um, these are some of uh, our, some of my relevant uh, disclosures. So let's just start with a case. 78 year old man with a history of hypertension, COPD, coronary artery disease, presented for a newly diagnosed adenocarcinoma for um, the work of the treatment. The cancer was in the right upper lobe, uh, which was found on a screening CT of this person and then eventually confirmed to be an adenocarcinoma on a transfer operation. He has pretty significant COPD due to very chronic smoking. Watch about half a block. He has uh, no significant other symptoms, uh, such as neurologic symptoms, no weight loss. Um, the only really other symptom he has is chronic cough. Uh, his past medical history is, uh, as I mentioned, hypertension, COPD, some questionable asbestos asbestosis, and uh, corn right from the branch block. He had past surgical history of and um, in terms of cancer, his mother had breast cancer, but no history of lung cancer. Uh, and his current medications are there, uh, all related to his hypertension. Kind of significant smoking history, uh, but he quit about five years ago. Uh, and no drugs or alcohol history. He's a retired truck driver, but otherwise very good detox. His vitals were pretty decent, boom air stats were 97. Uh, his breast sounds in the right base were pretty diminished. Uh, and his only function task is consistent with COPD with a, or actually both restrictive and obstructive disease with a 47% reduction of PD1 and about 54% reduction of PD3. <clears throat> okay, so his uh, FEV1 was 1.5. 1.15 and the ratio was 45% um, and DLCO was about 48% of predicted. And here's the CT scan. Uh, the CT scan is going to be pretty jumpy, but what I want you to look at is basically 
a um, right upper lobe nodule, which was biopsy, and a, a mediastinal lymph node. So here we go. Okay. Well, let me just let me just um, describe it to you. So on the CT and PET scan, CT and CT scan, there was a right upper lobe tiny lesion, and there was a um, 10R mediastinal lymph node. And then after two weeks of the CT scan, a PET scan was done, which showed a small, a small amount of pleural effusion. Now remember, this person had a TTNA of the right upper lobe lesion, which um, clinched the diagnosis of adenosine A. Now this person has a PET positive, small right pleural effusion. What would be your next step? And options are refer for surgical resection, refer for stereotactic radiation, EBUS guided mediastinal staging, mediastinoscopy, or thoracentesis. So let's get a quick answer. I'll give you five seconds to choose either A, B, C, D, or E, and then David can tell me how many, uh, what are the most popular answers. Okay, David. So we have uh, <clears throat> mostly for E and uh, one possible C. Very good. So very good answer. Uh, the reason you want to do E is um, it will give you the highest stage of the disease. So the patient had an ultrasound guided thoracentesis, uh, which showed 500 cc's of fluid. Um, the reason you would not do EBUS first is because EBUS, the highest level would be uh, stage 3A or 3B. In this person, probably 3A because it's N1, T2 disease. Um, but pleural effusion positivity will confirm, will confirm the stage 4 disease. However, in this patient, thoracentesis was done. Fluid, 500 cc of fluid was pulled. It was bloody. Um, it did improve his dyspnea. The WBC count was uh, 3,167, RBC is 4,000, and about 50% lymph, 36% neutrophils. LDH was 535, protein was 4.8, glucose was 93, amylase was 37. And the cytology was negative. No malignant cells were found in the pleural fluid. So, that sort of brings us to a point where do you really have to see malignant cells? And if you don't see, what do you do next? Okay, so as you all know, malignant pleural effusion uh, is a relatively common problem in malignancies. About 15% of all the patients with um, malignancies at some point would develop malignant pleural effusion. You have about 150,000 patients in the U.S. every year and about 40,000 in the U.K. every year with new malignant pleural effusion. Um, and if your, effusion, if your patient effusion is exudative, then you really have about 60 to 70 percent or more chance that this effusion will turn out to be malignant in the face of or in the backdrop of malignancy. Uh, which seems to be the case in this patient, right? This patient has a very high LDH, very high protein, bloody fusion in the face of a malignant lesion and potentially malignant lymphadenopathy, which is PET positive. So this is a very likely malignant pleural effusion. However, we don't have a uh, definitive proof by having malignant cells. In terms of Lung and breast cancer, they are the most common offenders in, when it comes to malignant pleural effusion. 75% of all the malignant pleural effusions are due to these two malignancies. And then lymphomas and mesotheliomas are the other ones. Now, why is it so important to know that you're dealing with malignant pleural effusion, in a, especially in a patient who has potentially, uh, who has a proven lung cancer? Because these patients have really poor prognosis. 
it really changes your entire strategy of management. So here's a, a publication from uh, Egypt looking at the life expectancy of malignant pleural implantation. What they did was they, they looked at uh, a, a pretty significant cohort of their patients, and divided them into patients who died within three months versus within one year. So people who died in three months were group A and people who died in one year were group two. And they looked at the demographics, the primary malignancies, the biochemical parameters in terms of LDH and pH to see what were the, were the features of people who died earlier than the other people. And they also looked at 30-day response rate of telcure diseases in these patients. So 85 patients, 40 of them died within three months, within actually 28 days, so within one month. And the other uh, 45 died after approximately within a year, after, uh, after nine months or so. An average of group two, uh, patient died in 205 days. So a very drastic difference between the two groups, more than 10 times, right? 28 days versus 200 days. And they looked at the people and their, and their, and their, their relevant malignancy. People who had colorectal cancer, breast cancer, which is an important one to remember because the vast majority of MPEs are due to breast. People who have breast cancer, liver, colorectal cancers had a very good prognosis, uh, sort of a relatively good prognosis, and lived uh, longer. And other patients didn't. Now, if you look at the significant factors in early mortality, you'll see that cancers like lung and stomach and bladder and esophagus and prostate had a very high mortality secondary to or associated with malignant pleural effusion. Uh, they, people who had low performance status, people who had low pH in this scenario, and people who had low concentration of glucose, which goes hand in hand with low pH. So, you know, the two most common cancers that you see with malignant pleural effusion, one has a really good prognosis, which is breast, or a in relatively good prognosis, and one has a very early mortality within, within a month, according to this study. And previous studies have shown within 100 days. So, sorry, I don't know what happened. So, um, basically, it makes a huge difference in how you, how you deal with this. So, bottom line is uh, high risk tumors poor performance of status, lower pleural fluid glucose, and are, are the predictors of early mortality. So these are the things to look out for and then manage patients accordingly. Our patient had a follow-up chest x-ray and chest x-ray shows that the pleural diffusion is coming back. Now the question is, what is your next step? So choices are pleuroscopy, repeat thoracentesis, surgical referral, EBUS guided mediastinal staging, placing a pleural catheter or closed pleural biopsy. I'll give you guys five seconds to choose either one, any letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then we will discuss that. Okay, David, do we have some answers? We have an overwhelming, uh, everyone's, most people are choosing E. There's one for pleuroscopy, A. <laughs> okay. So we will discuss these responses in the end, or if anybody, uh, so let me tell you what happened, and I'm sure we all will have slightly different um, choices and perspective. Um, but so I like the answer E. It's a good answer. 
But I think the presumption there is that patient has malignant pleural effusion and it's a stage four disease. So go with the minimally invasive approach, especially in a patient who has who belongs to, as we just discussed, uh, early mortality group, which means survival is less than three months and perhaps significantly less. So I, I, I like the thought process there. Uh, and then also it allows you to do the repeat plural fluid sampling. So, you know, although you are pretty comfortable with your decision, but if you see malignant cells, you will feel even better. Okay. So, what are the different ways to establish a diagnosis and be minimally invasive and achieve your goal? And then next yeah. question from there is, what is your goal? So here, uh, if you do plural biopsy, your, your success rate of making a diagnosis is about 44%. And then if you do just fluid cytology on first pass of the fluid, it's about 62%. If you did plural biopsy and fluid cytology, you will have about 75% success rate. If you did fluid cytology and through mediastinal thoracoscopy, so mediastinal thoracoscopy or medical, rather medical thoracoscopy, in and of itself has extremely high yield for making a diagnosis because you can see the pleural space and you can biopsy the pleura. And then mm. after that, depending on what's your therapeutic approach, you can even pluralize the patient by, by puderage or by some other chemical. So extremely high success rate. And you also are having access, have access to fluid analysis after you take the fluid out. So we're talking 96% or so diagnostic success rate if you did medical plurality. If you just did cytology again, you will have 62% of diagnostic yield. Plural biopsy is pretty much out of fashion these days because we have so many modalities to, to get the biopsy from where we want to. Now, if you talk about medical pleuroscopy, um, I, I'm sure many of you are very interested in it and do it. What are the primary differences between medical pleuroscopy? Some of the fundamental differences in medical pleuroscopy and surgical pleuroscopy or VATS is that medical pleuroscopy is minimally invasive significantly minimally invasive than surgical. You can do it in a No need to intubate the people. You can do it with flexible or rigid scope. Doesn't have to be a flexible scope. A lot of us do it in, with rigid scope. It gives us better optics and better control over potential complications such as bleeding. Usually it's done with single port. And usually it's done in bronchoscopy suite. Now, if you compare those things to VAT, VAT is almost always done under general anesthesia, um, and it requires double lumen intubation. So you need an OR room, do you need an anesthesiologist. It's almost always done with a rigid scope, but some of the sort of interventional pulmonologists slash thoracic surgeons are using flexible scope too when they need to. And it can be done with single port, uh, like medical paroscopy, but often done with multiple. And all of those things make it a significantly more expensive venture than a, a medical paroscopy, which is significantly cheaper. But the downside of medical paroscopy, if you will, is that you can only biopsy parietal pleura. You're not supposed to biopsy visceral pleura because you're not don't have the instrumentation and training to deal with the complications if you were biopsying this structure and you punctured the lung and you had a massive leak or massive bleeding. Um, you don't have a staple. You don't have anything to close that big leak if you created one. Uh, and then um, you are less, as I mentioned earlier, you're less capable of handling complications uh, with the medical paroscopy. Um, and you cannot break loculations and adhesions that that or surgical paroscopy. Those are some of the fundamental differences between medical and surgical paroscopy. King Lee did a very good study uh, about five, six, seven years ago uh, in um, Singapore and other countries where she uh, did a, took indeterminate accurate fluid effusion uh, 
in patients who had negative diagnostic uh, chlorosynthesis. Um, okay, I'm going to speak louder again because Russ just texted me that I'm getting quiet. So, <clears throat> uh, she looked at patients who had negative fluorosynthesis and negative closed pleural biopsies, and then pleuroscopy was performed on those patients along with talpuderage um, after making, uh, after having a high suspicion of malignancy and um, on endoscopic appearance of the effusion and the pleura. All of these were done in an endoscopy suite uh, under conscious sedation with uh, pathidine, which is their equivalent of morphine, um, on a, without intubation, with conscious sedation with Versed as well, and simple BP and EKG monitoring. And, there, and her accuracy was 96% in terms of diagnostic yield. And sensitivity was 96% and specificity was 100%. So it's an extremely effective modality to make a diagnosis in a uh, undiagnosed pleural effusion, especially in malignancies, but even in other diseases. So if you look here, uh, 24 of the patients had lung cancer associated malignant pleural effusion, which, and the total malignant for about 71%, including head and neck and breast cancer. Now, it's unusual that um, to see only one breast-associated mm -hmm. effusion and 24 lung cancer, but Singapore has a different population group. Perhaps their smoking rates are very high as compared to ours uh, in the neighboring country there as well. Uh, benign effusion, they, she was able to diagnose patients with TB fusion and other uh, benign diseases. So, very effective tool in establishing diagnosis in both benign and malignant. Complications were minimal, um, no major complications of um, massive bleeding or respiratory failure requiring intubation or anything. Um, minor complications were fever, pain, um, nothing very significant. This is another study which compares the indwelling catheters versus chest tube for calcoidesis for the relief of pain. It's called Time 2 trial from uh, Davies Group from Oxford in England. So, again, we're discussing the, the different ways of managing this patient who had presumed malignant pleural effusion without the definitive proof of cells, but very, very accurate effusion in the face of malignancy. And this is study, so one was pleuroscopy. And then the other option is you could do chest tube or you could do indwelling pleural catheter. In this study, Davies looked at, uh, they did an unblinded randomized trial comparing intrapleural catheters with calcoridesis with chest tube. 106 patients, seven centers in UK. Um, all of the patients had significant improvement in dyspnea and had a statistically significant improvement in IPC group or pleural catheter group compared to talc group. Length of initial hospitalization, this is the best part in my mind. IPC group zero, talc four days. So, you know, if you're talking about a patient who belongs to group one or high mortality group with a poor prognosis of somewhere between three, four weeks to two, to three months, uh, really you don't want to put these patients in the hospital for a long four or five days. Not only it's not very good uh, for the patient to spend four or five extra days of their life in the hospital while they've already spent a significant amount of time during diagnosis and treatment and chemo and radiation and surgery, um, and now another four or five days. But also, if economically, it's not a very feasible model. Uh, quality of life, uh, they said no significant difference, uh, but it's debatable. Uh, 22 patients. 22% of the patients in Cal group required further approval procedures compared to only 6% in IPC group. That's also a pretty significant statement uh, from a pretty large study and very well reputed chapter. Adverse events, there were more adverse events in plural catheter group versus uh, the 
work is a chest tube group. And we will talk about it in, in, in the last four or five slides, what are those adverse events and what happens. Most of these were simple infections treated with antibiotics. And I'll show you some data on that in the last four or five slides. Now, compare medical thoracoscopy to calcioridesis. Um, another study, prospective randomized talc cuterage versus gliomycin uh, pleurodesis in malignant perfusion. Um, and this was actually the heading should not be medical thoracoscopy and talc pleurodesis, but this is a different heading, a different study where 36 patients with malignant perfusion underwent gliomycin with a small bore thoracotomy uh, versus thoracoscopic talc cuterage. So uh, this is thoracoscopy talc cuterage and gliomycin compared. Thoracoscopic talc cuterage fluorodesis under low current is superior to bilumycin solution for fluorodesis in malignant perfusion with this final statement from this study showing uh, higher yield, higher sensitivity specificity, and a significant better uh, quality of life in these patients. In the interest of time, um, I have taken out a couple of slides to show you the uh, to be able to complete this case, which is going to go for a long time. It's relatively complicated. Anyways, our patient went, underwent fluoroscopy, and they saw these lesions on the pleural uh, surface. Um, there was a visceral pleural lesion, which is right obvious here. And then there's something here, looks like some mucus or something, uh, or fat on the parietal pleural. Remember, this becomes a sticking point for us, right? We can see this lesion, but we're not supposed to biopsy this. And we see this lesion, uh, which is yellow, and we can biopsy it, but we're not sure what it is. So we, we got this really juicy malignant lesion right in front of us, but we're not going to biopsy it because uh, we're, not, we're not prepared to deal with the complication. Okay, so you do... Let's say you do medical paroscopy, as was done in this case. After that, what do you do? Do you place a chest tube and admit the patient? Do you put a pleural catheter? Uh, so I will ask for you to give me an answer, A, B, C, D, or E. So how many of you will do telfluorodesis and IPC? How many of you will do telfluorodesis and chest tube? How many will do tunnel pleural catheter after pleuroscopy and discharge patient home? How many of you will do suction and until the lung expands and bubbles to stop, then discharge home and chest tube admit to inpatient service with panel chest for tomorrow. So, do we have any answers, David? Uh, let's give the audience a, a second there to go through all of these. And remember to put your, an your answers in the chat box. We have four answers right now, all picking C. Uh, there's one E, and mostly C and one E. Okay, so C is after pleuroscopy, you guys want to put a indwelling pleural catheter, discharge the patient home, um, and bring them back in two weeks. And other people are saying thoracoscopic talc pleurodesis and IPC placement. Again, both are right answers. There's no wrong answer here, right? Um, so you've done the pleuroscopy, you are in there, with, and you see a malignant lesion in the face of a, a very exudative effusion and lung cancer, then you might as well do a pleurodesis and close the case and come out, right? Because that's not a wrong answer. Or you might say, well, I want to leave the pleural catheter in, and I will... Uh, there's a good chance, 50, 60% chance, it will have pleurodesis in four or five weeks anyways, and then I'll come back then. So, so let's see what happens. The patient had a pleuroscopy, and patient had a indwelling pleural catheter placed and sent home. So that was done. There is a, there's a study that you might all know uh, from uh, Chuck Reddy and Armin Ernst group from multiple centers. Um, they did a multimodality technique. Where they, this was a pilot study where they did medical thoracoscopy with talc and once 
And after that, they put a tunnel pleural, pleural catheter as well as a large bore chest tube, which was removed after 24 hours. And, and the reason was, you know, all the clogged clumps of, of talc in the pleural space can clog the pleural catheter. So they wanted to get all the fluid out and also um, if there was any other fluid out and uh, clean up the space. And then uh, send the patients home after a couple of days, which was about 3.2 days in their study. They had 92% successful pleuridesis. It's a very high success rate, and tunnel pleural catheters were removed in about 17 days, as opposed to usual, uh, depending on what study you look at, 50, 60% success rate in 30, 40 days, right? There are many studies, and Tromblaze study, uh, one of the smallest studies that I published way back about eight, nine years ago from Penn, which had about 55% uh, pleurodesis in a matter of about 35 days. So these are all different studies showing, but now you have 92% pleurodesis. So multimodality approach is also a very valid way of doing this. Uh, it looks a little bit aggressive that you have two tubes coming out after a fluoroscopy but outcomes are pretty good. Well, our patient had a fluoroscopy and biopsy of the visceral optorital pleura, and here are the and here is the outcome: acute fibrinous pleuritis. Sorry, it should be S. Um, it's a typo. So that's what we thought, right? We were biopsying the yellow little fatty area and not able to biopsy the actual yellow dark black spot. So again, there is another question here. If one of you attending this meeting today is a thoracic surgeon, you might say, well, if thoracic surgeon was doing this, you could have biopsied the actual lesion and you would have had the diagnosis. And you would be right. Um, so my, my really, my, my, my goal here is to, 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 to present to you many different ways of doing this and trying to expand your horizons rather than having a very fixed approach to it. The next step, um, problem is you, you, you still don't have a definitive diagnosis of metastasis if you were going by the book, right? So, definitive treat, so what do you want to do now? Definitive treatment for stage 1A. Uh, request surgical biopsy for the pleural metastasis confirmation so that you could label this patient as stage four and treat them accordingly. Do you want to send the fluid from the fluorex catheter that you have placed after doing a thoracoscopy, um, medis medical thoracoscopy, pleuroscopy for further staging? Um, or you want to do something else like EBUS to biopsy that lymph node that you saw which was head positive. So let's choose one real quick. All right, David, how many people want to do D? So we have a couple of answers for D dog and one for B boy. Okay, so good. So I, I, like, I like it that people are thinking in a different way. So I, my, my assumption is people who are choosing D dog, it's because you, are, you still want to nail the definitive stage before you proceed with your treatment. Uh, and I think B-boy are doing the same thing. You are all now uh, thinking in terms of management and you want to, to nail the diagnosis. So good, very good. This patient had EBUS tBNA, 10R was positive, adenocarcinoma was diagnosed. Now, so this patient's stage is now a uh, N2, T1, N2 disease. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. So patient went for chemo XRT given poor baseline functional status. Um, patient has been followed up little catheter drainage, 200 cc decreased even after every other day. Two days ago, patient began to notice side tenderness and worsening redness of the catheter. 
no change in color or consistency of the pleural fluid. Patient denies any fever, chills, myalgia. Here's what the cath site looks like. Question is, what would you do at this point? Uh, choices are gramistine culture and remove the IPC and start on empiric antibiotic. Choice B is gramistain culture, DC catheter, and empiric IV antibiotic, as opposed to PO. C, gramistain culture, leave the catheter in, and start on empiric antibiotic, PO antibiotic. And then D, gramistain culture, continue catheter, and empiric PO antibiotic. Um, and then last is thoracic surgical and IV conflict. Okay, let's see what do you think. So there's a patient who has potentially malignant core diffusion, he's in chemotherapy, slightly immunocompromised potentially, and has a catheter site infection, but the fluid is looking okay. What would you like to do now? Okay, what, is, what, what do we have, David? I'll give a couple more seconds for a few more answers. We have mostly uh, answer C cat. Okay, so you guys want to do gramatin culture, continue IPC drainage, and empiric PO antibiotic. So your, uh, I think your your reasoning is the fluid is not infected, and it's just a, a skin infection, which is cellulitis probably. You want to treat with PO antibiotic. So that's not a wrong choice because you're not really losing anything, you can come back to it in three days and see what's going on and drain the fluid and culture the fluid. Um, clinical outcomes of individually fluid capital related to plural infection. This is what I was uh, alluding to earlier. So this study was done in Europe and Australia and North America, North America on 1,000 patients. It's a retrospective study, but a very big cohort and very multi-centric study. Um, only about 5% of the patients who had intrapleural indwelling catheter developed infection. And most of them were successfully treated with antibiotics without removing the catheter. So 94% successfully controlled with antibiotics. And only one patient died as a result of infection of the pleural space. And two patients had ongoing infection when they died of cancer progression. Um, most common infection is staph, staph aureus. Uh, Gram-negative infections were less, but they were associated with uh, increased need of antibiotics and more complications. Death in gram-negative uh, infection versus gram-positive. And the infection in the majority of the cases were managed without removing the catheter, as I mentioned. So only 5% of the patients developed infection. And if you look at the older studies, this rate is same or even less. Even in the very early studies when we were in, in, in the stage of infancy of using the pleural catheters. And then as time went on, we learned that big diabetic people with large skin folds are not good candidates. Post-infection pleurodesis happened in 31 patients, which is 62%, especially those infected with staph. Uh, so, again, um, infection causes pleurodesis too, but that's not the right way to do it. Uh, that's why we don't do it. Again, infection related to IPC, mostly staph. So when you're choosing your antibiotic, uh, be sure you cover staph for you. Now, what about the infections in patients who are undergoing chemotherapy? We always worry about it, right? We have a foreign body in somebody who is immunocompromised. We are changing dressings and cleaning this. We are potentially contaminating it every other day whenever we drink. This was a retrospective analysis of patients with plural catheters who were on chemotherapy. Um, 262 patients. Actually, 262 catheters, 243 patients. 66% of patients with rural catheters were on chemotherapy, uh, and 89 were not on chemotherapy. So 
reach toward 173 patients who were on chemotherapy. Uh, infections developed in only 6% of the patients, which is very close to uh, the number that we saw without the chemotherapy. The rate of complication in the chemotherapy group was 55.2% compared to 7.9% in the whole group. So it doesn't look like chemotherapy predisposes patients with indwelling fluid catheters uh, to infection. Part of the reason is they are tunnel catheters. That's how they were designed. And tunnel catheters allows you to catch the skin infection much sooner before it gets to the pleural space and affects the pleura. Again, the same breakdown. Um, the uh, patient with pleural catheters, uh, with malignant pleural effusion, received chemo, did not receive chemo. Patients who did receive chemo Skin infection is 5 in polymerase 4, skin infection is 2 in polymerase 5. So it's pretty compatible. Just that perhaps in chemo group, uh, the uh, infection actually not statistically significant, but maybe it just gets a little quicker to the solar space, but it's not proven by any study. Well, let's get back to our patient. <clears throat> our patient's catheter. Uh, our patient's catheter was removed. He was put on a 10-day PO course of doxy um, and catheter signs twice to heal. Now, as I said, you could go either way. Remove the catheter or not remove the catheter. Watch it. Give antibiotics. Culture the fluid later. Culture the catheter if you remove it. Anyway, this patient got better with few antibiotics and catheter removal and went for radiation. And four days following radiation to that area where the tumor was, the patient developed a erythema at the site of wound infection and foul smelling drainage. The um, patient was treated with <clears throat> another course of antibiotic. Uh, sorry, this in place. Here is what the infection, what the site looks like. What do you guys think this is? Um, badly infected, and perhaps some tumor growth in that area, too, because the wound has dehessed and is looking very necrotic. So what would you do now? Would you get, let's, let's get answers really quickly. Um, we have only about eight, nine minutes to go. What would you do now? CT chest, radiation stop, surgical IV Antimicrobial wound care, all of the above, or just ABCD. Okay, David. So we have uh, answers for both E as well as F. A lot of F, <laughs> but some E's. ABCD, so surgical referral, DC radiation, obtained C. Okay, so it's good. You're you're playing very safe here now because the wound is pretty ugly. Um, so here is a study published recently last year actually from Australia. From, uh, uh, um, I can't remember the name, Lee's group. It's a center, single center retrospective review in indwelling fluid catheters inserted over 44 months. Catheter tract metastasis is what we were looking at there on top of infection. And it's a it's a it's a uncommon but pretty ugly problem. Um, it's defined as a solid chest wall lesion over IPC insertion site or tunnel area cutaneously, and it is, for all practical purposes, it's a malignant tract metastasis. 110 patients uh, had 107 catheters. 60 of them were mesothelioma. So remember this mesothelioma not lung cancer, not breast cancer, because Australia, in that part of Australia, uh, mesothelioma is pretty common. Metastasis has developed in 11 cases. 10% of the patient developed nine of the malignant pleural mesothelioma, so very high rate uh, of almost 10% of mesothelioma patients developing tract metastasis. Um, but another thing, after a very long time, Median is 280 days. 
And if you look at the, some of the longer cathode durations, it's close to 700 days. And this is true that metacellular patients tend to keep catheters for a long time. They're poor prognostic patients. And um, it's a horrendous disease, and diffusion doesn't go away. And the fluid space is involved with the, the options of other things like fluoridesis are much less because sometimes you have trapped lung in this situation, too. So two factors very um, closely related to catheter tract metastasis uh, are mesothelioma and the prolonged duration. In our case, um, wound care or antibiotics without interruption of radiation therapy or chemotherapy were uh, suggested and carried out, and our patient did okay. And that I'll stop here, uh, and I'll um, let you guys ask me any questions you have. We have a few minutes, uh, six, seven minutes or more, to answer any questions you may have. So at this point in time, I'm going to open up the floor, and I'm going to unmute the audience. However, I will request if you're not asking questions, you can mute your own individual speaker or through the iMeet app to try to minimize the amount of background noise if possible. Um, so the uh, first time yield of pleural diffusion uh, for synthesis is about 50%. If you tap again, you increase your yield by another 10% or so, and that, that's about it. The third and fourth taps don't necessarily increase your yield. So if I don't get cytology positive after first or second, then I move on to the next method of sampling or um, malignancy is high, what we call para malignant fusion, and I go with the therapeutic path. This is a question from uh, Ala Elgendi. Um, you can go ahead and ask your question, please. Well, actually, I see it. It says there's, this is a question on utility of fluorect and refractory heart failure patient as far as I read. It is in, indicated. So you're right. Um, uh, it is per se not indicated, but believe it or not, I just did a fluoridesis on a patient of mine today uh, who has congestive heart failure. Last week, she wanted to go home or something over the weekend, and she was tired of having taps again and again, and her medical management was failing. So I said I would put the plural catheter in you with the promise that you will come to me next week so we can tour these you. So she did. She came back, and I just, <clears throat> today, a few hours ago, put Dr. Cycling uh, for plural adhesive. So the answer is it is not a long-term management and or primary management of fluid diffusion due to congestive heart failure because you deplete your patient from very vital nutrients, proteins, and et cetera. However, if it's a short-term treatment with the intent to do a definitive treatment very soon, and your goal is to avoid repeated photosynthesis of putting a chest tube, then it's okay. It's a tool. Rural catheter is a tool, and it's up to you how you use it. Any other questions from the floor? Well, Dr. Musani, one of the one of the issues that I will sometimes run into is for especially uh, hematologic cancers, the chemotherapy that is being planned may be particularly immunosuppressive. So one of the questions that often comes up is, what is the risk of soft tissue infection or pleural infection with an indwelling pleural catheter in that higher risk pop or theoretically higher risk population? That's a great question. And there was a study uh, recently published, um, I think in 2015, I'm blanking on the name of the, <clears throat> of the uh, group, and they looked at the complication of Indwelling pleural catheter in the hematologic um, and the, the risk of infection was found to be very consistent with, or very similar to, the risk of infection in pleural malignancy. 
in, in patients with chemotherapy. So bottom line was the risk of infection is not significantly increased in people who are under uh, who are going through uh, nine uh, rather liquid malignancies, so to speak, um, and are on chemotherapy. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, at this point, uh, if there's no other further questions, uh, Dr. Musani, I think we'll probably wrap up, unless there's any last questions. Okay. Uh, very thankful. Um, thanks for listening, and um, I am um, available to answer even afterwards if you have any questions. Go ahead and email me or um, send a message on the website of the APIC. All these uh, webinars will be posted on the AABIP website in a few days, so you can always listen to them later on or anybody else wants to. At this point, uh, this will conclude today's webinar. I wanted to thank again Dr. Ali Musani for joining us and uh, educating us on this very interesting topic. Thank you everyone for participating. Just so you know, our next scheduled webinar will be a pre presentation by uh, Dr. Kevin Kovitz, and that will be on March 22nd at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Keep an eye out for your emails, and you'll get an advertisement for that from the AABIP, and it will be on the topic of starting an IP practice and practical consideration. Thank you very much for joining us today.